Greetings and salutations, and welcome to the third episode of the Ontario Pharmacists Association's Pharmacist Matters podcast. We established the Pharmacist Matters podcast in March of this year to be a compelling destination for pharmacy professionals and pharmacy industry stakeholders. Our goal is to bring you interesting guests and relevant topics to help you manage your business and pharmacy practices. On today's episode, we have three dynamic guests to talk about the financial implications of COVID-19 to pharmacy and what resources are available for business owners and pharmacists, as well as the impact on mental health of our very important healthcare professionals. Starting with Alexander Chagnon, he's the founder of Ask Your Pharmacist, and he'll be joining us to talk about the telehealth service for pharmacists employed by more than 10,000 patients monthly. Alex has a background in being a recipient of many awards, as well as uh, focusing in on mental health of uh, pharmacy professionals. He's the co-founder of Therapix, a company involved in the curation of digital health tools and their deployment in clinical settings. In recent months, its work has won him the Innovation Prize of the Quebec College of Pharmacists, the Merck Patient First Award, and the Leadership Award from the Canadian Foundation for Pharmacy, an honorary award from Quebec Economy and Innovation Minister, and the 2019 New Business Award. He is the author of four scientific publications on the use of telehealth by pharmacists as a clinical researcher. He is now completing his postgraduate diploma in health informatics and is involved as a guest lecturer for pharmacy students in the Quebec-based Faculty of Pharmacy. He also sits on various advisory committees, including the Digital Therapeutic Alliance in the United States, among others. Also joining us today is is Yvonne Harding. Yvonne is the Manager of Resource Development for the Assaulted Women's Helpline and Senior Safety Line. She is responsible for all aspects of the organization's fundraising, from events to grants to individual donations. In addition to the fundraising portfolio, she also manages the helpline's communications. Yvonne began her career in advertising and then moved on to marketing research and planning. She has volunteered extensively in education and minor sports. In her spare time, she can be found walking giant dogs, reading or playing hockey. We'll have to hear about those dogs, Yvonne. Mike Jasko. Mike is a well-known pharmacy advocate for community pharmacy and pharmacists. As a pharmacist and past pharmacy owner, Mike has over 40 years of experience in the Canadian retail drugstore industry. He also received a formal education in business and personal finance and is a partner and portfolio manager with a private investment management firm, KJ Harrison. He is the co-editor of Pharmacy Management in Canada and a regular contributor to pharmacy industry publications. Mike acts as a trust advisor to independent pharmacy owners on matters associated with succession planning, business valuation, and business transition. He also provides valuable insights on issues of wealth management pertaining to estate matters, corporate structure, tax planning, and pharmacy valuation. During these challenging times, it is important to have these discussions. Pharmacists and pharmacy stakeholders need to know what resources are available to them as they deal with both the pandemic and influx of patients into their stores. We are coming off a very successful advocacy week at the Ontario Pharmacists Association. And before we dive into our first guest, I wanted to take a a few moments to talk about uh, the recent activity related to the 30-day supply limitation that was initiated by the Ontario government back in March. As many of our listeners will know, OPA has been advocating for the government to step in and ensure that no patients face an additional financial barrier as a result of responsibly managing the supply chain to prevent drug shortages. We know this policy has been extremely challenging for many of our members and pharmacists across not only Ontario, but across the country as well. This week on May 13th, the Ontario government announced that they will be stepping in and providing coverage of any additional co-payments from May and June for all ODB recipients. This is very welcome news and something that we've been asking for essentially since the policy was first introduced. One of the unintended consequences was that pharmacists were left uh, having to explain this to patients, and patients didn't necessarily, in the initial days, understand the complexity of the supply chain 
and the rationale for implementing safeguards to ensure that everybody has the medications they need when and when and where they need them. As a result, there was some negative attention from media and various other groups about the policy. And I want to say that we're very proud of the pharmacists for providing exceptional service to patients throughout these challenging times. At a time when many uh, new patients were coming into stores, we put in place so many different uh, measurement um, mechanisms to protect patients with physical barriers, as well as um, a number, number of other innovative approaches to ensure that patients continue to get the care when and where they needed it. That included an increase in home deliveries of medications, doing things like curbside pickup, and managing their stores in a way that would ensure that there was safe physical distancing of patients. When the government first tabled their proposal to the Ontario Pharmacists Association and the Neighbourhood Pharmacy Association of Canada back in April, we expressed our initial disappointment that it did not go far enough in terms of covering the financial uh, impact that the policy had on pharmacies and that it initially included a very complex implementation method. Since that day, we have been working collaboratively with the government to come up with alternatives, including full coverage of the co-payment for the next two months. In addition, we worked on implementing a streamlined and less burdensome implementation method that wouldn't cause unnecessary administrative complications for pharmacies. We're very pleased that we partnered with the Canadian Association of Retired Persons throughout this time in order to continue to apply pressure to the government to understand the need to step in. In addition to that, we also launched a very proactive social media campaign to underscore the need for government support. We now move forward uh, with a partnership with government where we can now focus on expanded scope of practice and a number of other important initiatives, especially as we start planning for the next flu season, which is rapidly approaching in terms of the planning processes. In addition to the flu season, we also need to be prepared as healthcare providers to be instrumental in the distribution of the future COVID-19 vaccine. As one of the most accessible healthcare providers, we have an important role to play in ensuring that the population in Ontario and of course across Canada is vaccinated. So with that, I wanted to jump right into our discussion today. I think the uh, this whole theme around mental health and, and abuse and addictions is something that is um, going to be even more important given the circumstances we all find ourselves in. Um, and you know, I know we 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 talk about our challenges in our healthcare system, uh, capacity challenges, the access issues, uh, particularly as it pertains to mental health and addictions. Lots of investments have been made by government uh, over the last couple of years and beyond that uh, to try to address the, uh, the challenges. But uh, Alex, I know you have uh, looked at this from a couple of different perspectives and um, I really wanted to uh, open it up for, for your uh, thoughts and, and insights on uh, you know, what, what more can be done and what are the types of tools that are available for patients and for uh, pharmacists uh, across Canada to uh, help uh, people deal with this. Yes, so you're right, actually, Justin. Uh, there are a lot of issues when it comes to accessing mental health resources and services across Canada. So uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, governments investing millions in uh, providing services to Canadians in the space of mental health. So uh, it, with, the, with RAPIX, we are involved in the curation processes of those uh, services and tools uh, with an, a focus on uh, digital health tools. So uh, everything that is digital, we looked at it and we make sure that uh, the, the, better the, the, the most efficient and the, the best tools uh, stands out uh, for patients and pharmacists alike. So it, it all started with the need for a reliable way to assess if it or not an app should be recommended to a patient uh, from the therapeutics perspective. So in the first few months, so uh, uh, after we launched this venture, we gathered all the frameworks that were previously published in the literature 
And we ended up with an observation that even if it is really time consuming to access apps, a whole lot of people, organizations and healthcare professionals need a way to stay on top of fast iterations uh, that defines the sector of digital health. So at Therapix, actually, we developed our own framework and we gathered a diversified group of clinicians, so doctors, nurses, pharmacists, psychologists, whose goal is to assess the apps that feel, that fail under the scope of practice and expertise. Um, we then bu uh, build a boat, uh, a bot, a robot that crawls the internet and collect the information about the apps for those clinicians. And this bot also serve as a way to get notified when an app is updated. An event that occurs way faster in the digital health space than in the traditional pharmaceutical sector. Uh, and, and so those clinicians, since the, the early days of the pandemic, our bot also and our internal team at Therapix, uh, we are able to produce what we call app formularies, which is the equivalent of drug formularies, but it only contains digital health tools. Uh, meaning health and wellness, wellness apps, uh, software as medical device, and digital therapeutics. So all words and <laughs> all definitions that are made in use to, to some pharmacists, that, but I think we will uh, hear a whole lot more uh, about those in, in the next couple of months and years. That's uh, very interesting. And are you are you hearing from frontline healthcare providers, pharmacists, and others uh, on the the mental health impacts of COVID nineteen, both from you know a fear and anxiety perspective of risk of infection and and maybe even a lack of the personal protective equipment and how that may impact uh, their uh, lifestyles back home when they um, perhaps even quarantine from their families. But also just the uh, you know the stress of uh, the influx of patients and trying to manage uh, stores during this time. Do you are you hearing stories about that and and are those resources uh, uh, directly accessible by pharmacists? Yes, actually, in the early days of the pandemic, we launched a uh, a software uh, which is accessible through the COVID19.therapix.com, uh, which um, is used by pharmacists and patients alike to um, to get the best available digital tools for their particular um, situation and need. And what is interesting uh, about this tool is that we are able to track the effectiveness of every match tool. So as an example, we measure the level of anxiety from patient or pharmacist prior the match of the app. And we uh, measure it again seven days afterward. So this is this allows us to add a layer of additional security to the formularies we built, but also to have um, a sense of where exactly is the anxiety levels the highest in Canada, uh, and also in which age group. And what we can see right now is that there are a lot of healthcare professional that are, and I won't. I won't teach, uh, learn to you anything here, but we are under a lot of pressure and this results into a um, high level of anxiety that we measure using the GAD7 tool. So, so yeah, and this is across Canada, actually. In Ontario, in BC, and in Quebec, those provinces are the ones that we measure the highest level of anxiety right now. So it's interesting you mentioned uh, about different age cohorts um, where the stress might be uh, uh, the big, have the biggest impact and also regional. Um, do you have any data that supports um, where where in the country is the anxiety the highest and in which age which age categories? Yes. So right now, even if we don't have a, a lot of data to to make sure that it's it's as robust as we want it to be, the, the preliminary need data that we have right now shows that in Ontario and in Quebec and on, in the, um, the youngest age group, so the youngest people, so people under 40 years old are the ones that are the most stressful uh, right now um, in the line of the pandemic and the COVID-19 situation. So, so and it, it is not that in other age groups, uh, people are not stressed. It's it's way more that the the, the people that are age uh, forty uh, and uh, and younger are are more stressed. And this is this is something that is strange to me because we know that we know for a fact that 
the COVID-19 uh, is really something that it, it's, it's risky and it, it generates a lot of, uh, of fear among older patients. But this is not what we found uh, using our tool. It's interesting to think about what are the long-term impacts of COVID-19 and the transformation of healthcare delivery, I think, will be paramount among the new normal, if you will, with respect to how patients access services. Um, I even think about it from uh, the perspective of uh, employees and way the way people work. Um, will we see more acceptance an adoption of work from home uh, environments. Uh, now that the infrastructure and many of the uh, internal plans of, of corporations and businesses have uh, essentially permitted this and, and set it up for success and have measured a lot of the gains from productivity and other areas from employees. Um, from a healthcare perspective, you know, virtual care, accessing it through a phone and apps, um, you know, there was that before, no question, uh, before COVID-19. But now with even billing codes being set up in certain provinces to allow for virtual physician visits, um, I think some of that is also in play for, for pharmacists where there's not a hands-on service. Um, what do you see as the as the future of healthcare in terms of um, the adoption rates and uh, and also the payers' appetite to continue to fund uh, more virtual care? That's a great question. Actually, uh, I think that the next couple months and years we will see a whole lot more of employers uh, um, making digital health tools available to their patient and drive patients and employees. Uh, to cost-saving uh, measures that are enable, enabled by the digital health tools. Uh, from a pharmacist perspective and standpoint, in my opinion, there are two reasons why pharmacists want to learn or learn about or maybe even prescribe digital health tools. And we'll, we'll see a lot more of these uh, of these actions in the near future, I think, because as you mentioned, COVID-19 is really a catalyst for virtual care. Uh, so the first one, I think, from a pharmacist perspective is to treat a patient uh, in the form of an app that could be added to a pharmaceutical treatment, which we call a companion app, or using a standalone application. And, and Justin, we see a lot of studies uh, being performed right now about companion apps. Uh, as an example, Novartis are studying the added effect of an app uh, to siponimod, which is a drug used in multiple sclerosis. And this drug takes, uh, the drug takes care of the physical aspect of the disease, and the app is used to alleviate the psychological aspects of MS. And since we know for a fact that when psychological aspects of the disease are not well taken care of, uh, physical symptoms are worsened. So this is something that we will see a, a, whole, a whole lot more in, in the near future. And we, we not, let's not assume that no therapeutic apps are, are, are yet available in the market. Uh, Sleepio, as an example, is an app used to treat insomnia and is available in Canada. It costs $300 for a 12-week program. And several studies were performed about the effectiveness of this app. And it appears that more than half the people we complete the program improve significantly their sleep. So there are there are apps out there. It, it, we just need to find those and, and to make them available to patients. And this is what we're doing at Therapix for two years now. Oh, that's great to uh, to better understand some of the uh, resources that are available for clinicians and and patients. And I, I think about the testing, particularly around capacity uh, of COVID nineteen. So when we look at the measures being lifted, and much of the talk now is on reopening the economy. And uh, I think there certainly is um, merit in in having a phased approach. But uh, you know what what impact will that have on a potential second wave? Um, you heard the uh, the World Health Organization call this, um, I think yesterday or a couple of days ago, an endemic now, not a pandemic, something that uh, will have um, permanency in terms of uh, impact and uh, even other strains that are similar to this and more severe uh, along the lines of influenza. Uh, we could be in store for that uh, this coming uh, 
uh, uh, uh, you know, flu season. So what, what I wonder about is, you know, where, where's the capacity for the testing and, and, you know, do we end up with home tests? Um, and that data collection component, I think is going to be critical, um, understanding the privacy implications, uh, but being able to do home tests, uh, as, as the technology evolves and, uh, you know, knowing, you know, the vaccine being available, uh, we hope soon, but, but certainly it's going to take some time. Um, what are your thoughts around that? Well, uh, you mentioned privacy, you mentioned maybe device tracking in the term of COVID-19. Those are all things that are happening really fast right now. And as healthcare professional, we, we weren't talked about this in pharmacy school. So, so as, as someone involved in the pharmacy space and also into the, in, in the virtual, virtual, uh, virtual care space, I'd say that we need to keep an open mind about those tools, but to make sure that the privacy uh, of our uh, citizens and patients are considered uh, before we launch uh, initiative to help and restart the economy. I, I'm all about the, the, the fact that we need to, to, to kickstart and restart this economy uh, in Canada, but it, it doesn't need and doesn't have to be uh, done uh, in, in, uh, in the way that patient could be armed uh, and their privacy could be affected. So it's really important for pharmacists to know that if you are involved in the uh, recommending uh, recommendation of apps to your patients or even the consumption of apps for yourself, uh, there are resources available and we provide with one of those resources. It's a webinar that can be assessed which is uh, sponsored by the Canadian Foundation for Pharmacy. It's everything you need to know as a pharmacist before prescribing or consuming apps for yourself. And so, so make sure to, to, to get a sense of what is important before recommending apps and, and, and learn about it before doing so. Because when, when you started to discuss apps with patients, it, it could be too late to, to go back and say, okay, no, this app was not okay. And, and this is also true for governments and, uh, and, uh, and payers uh, that are involved in the diffusion of apps right now. Uh, we talk about the federal government with their uh, Wellness Together Canada. There are apps available through this, um, this uh, portal. And so as pharmacists, we can learn from uh, governments and, and look at the ways that they uh, were um, they, they were involved in the diffusion and the selection of those apps, and uh, just to build our confidence uh, in the, in because it will be our turn uh, soon or later to to recommend apps for patients because apps are using it. We know it in Canada. One out of three patients use the um, one at least one health app on their device. So we need to be involved as pharmacists to stay relevant in this space. Thank you, Alex, for sharing your insights and perspectives. Yvonne, uh, definitely want to have a conversation about some of the impacts this uh, this terrible pandemic has had on uh, people who uh, are in uh, uh, unfortunate circumstances and uh, abusive uh, situations. And I know uh, when you and I last spoke, we talked about some of uh, some of the initiatives that were going on. Uh, in other countries to um, provide uh, outlets and um, safe harbor and certainly um, uh, early warning signs and indications for help. Um, really would like to hear from your perspective, what, what are you seeing uh, in terms of the impact of the pandemic, some of the restrictions uh, that have been placed on citizens to stay at home more? You know, what are some of the unintended consequences of that uh, from uh, a women's uh, abuse perspective? Um, and what do you think... Uh, as an industry, we can do to help. Um, I think we're we're certainly well positioned with um, healthcare professionals in in all communities across the province. But I know we can be doing more, and and certainly uh, interested in some of your thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, this has had an uh, shed an, a light on an issue that was already um, of grave concern to those of us who have been working in the violence against women community. And the stay at home measures have just um, made it more difficult for women who were already in dangerous and um, 
complicated situations um, because it is given the upper hand to their their partners, their abusers, where isolation we know is one of the um, key control measures. So now you've had this forced isolation uh, contact has been cut off for a number of of, of uh, women who would normally turn to outside supports and have a, a, a break in their day, um, an opportunity to get a little bit of respite. And what we're seeing uh, from the calls that we're getting is that um, the situations are escalating um, from what were previously manageable to um, quite quite frightening um we've we've had uh, we're receiving over a thousand calls a week to the assaulted women's helpline um and the alarming thing for us is that we're also seeing a huge increase in the number of calls that simply are not able to get through um we are a provincial line we're receiving calls from women across the country now as well so that's adding additional strain and pressure to to our lines and to our counselors who are trying to um provide uh these women from outside of ontario with help and supports so you know one of the the situation has really increased the risks um we knew that uh, women were in um, women who were in these situations um, often had outside supports available, and what we're what we're trying to do is is help them manage um, as best they can, um, and where the situations are really untenable and are uh, and people are at greatest risk, um, helping them to leave and leave safely. Um, we're uh, and leaving is a high risk um, time. Um, you know that's uh, there's been too many incidents already since the pandemic. Nine women and girls have been um, victims of domestic homicide, um, and it just points to the challenges around leaving. So our counselors are working with women to help them. Um, uh, create safety plans um, to help them learn how to manage and de-escalate the situation that they're facing uh, and um, providing and helping to provide them with um, alternatives and options and to seek shelter where it's available. Um, and that's, that's uh, a very, very challenging thing. We've seen a 400% increase in the number of calls that are specifically requesting emergency shelter. And um, that was something that was difficult to accommodate before the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, with pressures on the shelter system, the need to um, address uh, safety concerns and measures and, and uh, social distancing within shelters, that's also created additional strain there. So we're really seeing this coming from all angles, Justin. And it's, it's uh, I, you know, I feel like I'm going all over the place, but part of uh, the challenge is that um, we're just facing such pressure on our lines to help these women and the options available have become fewer because so many of the supports that we would regularly um, uh, turn to and be able to offer to these women um, are reduced or simply unavailable at this point in time. Can you speak a little bit about um, how does the provincial government support uh, your efforts and, and what's that connection to the shelters like um, and, and particularly during this time, um, you know, are there, is there availability in the shelters and, and what's your take on that? So um, the, the provincial government has um, been extremely supportive of, of the helpline um, and is doing what they can to provide additional monetary support to the shelter system and to um, 
our crisis line. We just received some additional funding um, that was announced on Friday uh, to allow us to put more counselors on the lines to help with the increase in calls and to work on developing an, an online and, and uh, text platform to also uh, make it possible for those women who are finding it really difficult to call when their abuser is present and feel um, uh, highly restricted in being able to have a conversation. Uh, They've also, there has been a lot of federal funding that has been granted to the shelter system. Um, and uh, that has gone, you know, primarily towards helping shelters support um, the additional measures they need to take around COVID-19. Um, it's not necessarily increasing shelter space. Uh, and certainly within the GTA, that space is extremely limited we we are having um uh to uh really dig deep to find space uh i think early we were receiving uh we were able to place about two women in a three-week period into shelters because their space was just that limited and part part of the limitations are some shelters are having to take in fewer women to be able to accommodate physical distancing um and some shelters outside of, uh, in more remote areas, the challenge there is for women to actually access the shelters and to get there safely. So we're, you know, we're seeing um, uh, a high demand, but um, difficulties in accessing the space, whether it's limitations in, in transportation and being able to get there safely, or whether it's just the space isn't available in the areas that they are. Um, so that for us means um, a lot more creativity in terms of safety planning and working with people to, who are unable to leave at this point in time. We talked last time, uh, Yvonne, uh, about uh, some of the things that were going on in Spain and, and some of the other countries on how uh, pharmacies, community pharmacies, helped with code words and things of that nature. What have you learned about that? And, and have you thought about some other measures that we could implement and partner on uh, to help um, uh, these uh, people in, in unfortunate circumstances? And, uh, you know, we as a group, we want to, you know, it breaks our heart that uh, these things are happening and you know you look at abuse and mental health across the board and the uh, certainly the impacts of uh, all the restrictions and the pandemic is having it's uh, you know coming out of this we're going to need to really understand how we can help um, you know all people but in this particular situation what are your thoughts around uh, the role of, of a pharmacist and uh, some of the things that are going on uh, outside of Canada? Um, so there's there really is some interesting things that are happening. I know that uh, Boots in in the UK has been involved in um, uh, programs to support um, victims of domestic violence and, and assist them. And of course, the um, uh, the programs in in France and Spain and Italy that we had talked about. Um, there's certainly some some challenges with you know code words and um and signs and signals and and ensuring that um the you know when they're used they're used with intention um and there's an understanding of what um what the woman wants to happen whether it is intervention whether um uh whether they're at risk or what whether they need just some support and we often say you, know, you it's it's best if we can work if the woman can work with a friend and and know precisely what she wants so that someone is in intervention with good intentions and potentially creating a, a riskier situation um for for the person um the pharmacy network is amazing and and you know i've, I've I think they're, we're just at the tip of the iceberg and, and uh, we're seeing this increase in calls. We know that this is not going to go away and we know that as the economics, the full economic impact and, and some of the things that Mike was talking about earlier in this 
podcasts are felt, um, we're we're going to see more and more pressure on our lines, on women uh, in as their situations at home. Maybe they're managing right now. In two months from now, when there's no income coming in um, and there's rent due or there's mortgage payments due and people are really struggling, there's going to be a, uh, this is, this is just going to increase for us. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to work with, um, with the pharmacy association to be able to ensure that, um, that we can get our number out there for both the assaulted women's helpline so that the, and the senior safety line so that the agency is with the woman to be able to call and share her story so that our counselors can work with her to provide her best options and and know that that's what she wants and feel confident that this will be the best step for her and the best measure. So I think it's how do we get our number out there uh, um, to as many pharmacies as possible um, and with some, you know, short tips for people who um, – you know, maybe looking to to leave. Uh, there's some also some interesting programs with cell phone distribution, and you know we're we're exploring a number of ideas. It's trying to manage our own internal resources um, and prioritize that we are still there for women while trying to figure out what else we can do. So um, we're we're certainly open to all sorts of suggestions and to. Um, creatively coming up with some new ways to to reach women to let them know that we exist um we do get fifty thousand calls a year we know that there's a lot more women out there who could probably use our services um we also get another ten thousand from uh to our senior safety line and we know that uh this is also um posing some serious challenges and putting a lot of seniors at risk at the at present too well, this is an important conversation, and as a as a father of three daughters, uh, a husband, um, it's certainly important uh, from my perspective that we provide leadership uh, as a pharmacy association. Um, look to partner with you and and others in this space to uh, provide uh, tools and. Um, safety for uh, for all people of abuse and i think this uh, conversation certainly needs to continue but i do appreciate you sharing some of your thoughts and insights and uh, giving a perspective of what's happening uh, on the ground with uh, with this uh, challenging situation so thank you for for joining us so with that i wanted to jump right into our discussion today with our financial uh, matters mike you've been involved uh, in advising pharmacies and pharmacists for a number of years. I'm sure you've never come across something quite as unprecedented as what we're experiencing with the pandemic. But maybe you can start from a macro level and just talk about some of your observations and what you see as the, the impacts to, uh, to pharmacy and, in fact, uh, to our broader economy. Sure. I'm in a unique vantage point, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to reach out to my peers as fellow pharmacists. While I may not practice, um, I'm still very much um, connected uh, to the industry, and um, and so I am happy to share my thoughts. So I travel across the country these days, obviously virtually, and I will say that uh, this would be at least a five standard deviation event. Um, compared to the normal, and there will be a new normal. I found as I've, I've spoken with literally hundreds of independent pharmacy owners from coast to coast to coast, all three coasts, there's no two pharmacies and pharmacy operations uh, that are the same. Uh, needless to say, uh, there's no one that has escaped um, what the effects of uh, COVID-19 and will not escape what are yet to be uh, determined are the knock-on effects. And uh, whether it's an operational impact, um, shortened hours in some cases, increased deliveries, initiating deliveries in some cases where that was not the case, the uh, frequency of phone calls um, related to um, getting information about COVID-19, 
has been dramatic. Uh, trying to operate a pharmacy um, with uh, social distancing considerations. Uh, physicians' offices closed or reduced accessibility really has underscored in, in my experience uh, the fact that um, there is a, a very strong community support um, offered by frontline uh, retail pharmacy um, employees and staff. And for that, I absolutely am proud to be one, happy to support, and I'm, uh, I think you're, you're the unsung heroes out there in the profession and in the healthcare industry today. So with that, perhaps we can chat, chat a little bit about um, what's available. It's, um, it's a situation that uh, provides a natural scene in everyone's life on a personal level and on a commercial level. And it's an opportunity to and a time to reflect and assess. Um, overall, I've seen, um, as I've indicated in my opening remarks, that um, no one's um, gone unaffected, if you will. Um, for the most part, um, what I'm seeing out there is that the prescription uh, practice itself, while affected, uh, there's, an, there's a definitely, at the very least, um, a consistent demand. And so that in and of itself um, does put independent pharmacy owners in a relatively better situation than many of the thousands of Canadian uh, privately owned, um, family owned um, businesses that are, are not um, enjoying that same type of, of outcome and benefit. You know, I think you, you certainly started off with um, one point that I want to emphasize that uh, we are fortunate as businesses that pharmacies are able to remain open. There are a number of businesses that uh, certainly have not had that uh, opportunity. That said, you know, there are uh, challenges and, and certainly operating costs that have increased uh, due to uh, the uh, ability to and the need to retrofit their stores with physical barriers. And they're seeing, while they're seeing more patients come in for prescriptions, they're seeing less uh, foot traffic for some of the uh, other business areas in the front of store. So I think there's definitely a need out there for more information sharing and knowledge of what's available for them to tap into. Sure. So um, let's, let's dive in sort of from 50,000 feet. Um, uh, there are there are um, pharmacies out there that have been um, quite dramatically affected, um, which which is a different experience from a, a broader footprint. Um, pharmacies that I'm finding that are associated with clinics um, are uh, definitely suffering, particularly because of the drop of foot traffic, and in some cases, those medical practitioners, physicians and their support um, staff um, are simply not in the clinics. So those, those groups, uh, I am seeing um, uh, a real potential opportunity here uh, to visit uh, some websites. So the federal government um, has done a really, really good job of um, stepping in here and providing some um, both monetary and fiscal policy support um, to, to manage uh, the migration from what became and still is uh, a monumental um, health issue to one that's clearly become a uh, self-imposed uh, economic um, challenge for the entire world. And so to that end, um, the federal government um, has, has built uh, an excellent website and a number of subdirectories, as well as the, uh, the Business Development Bank of Canada uh, working in unison. And uh, there's a there's a, a Canadian COVID nineteen economic response plan, and uh, I encourage um, listeners to to uh, have a look see at those websites, and we'll we'll have them posted. And I'm just going to touch on some of the the highlights that support um, some of the pharmacy businesses to avoid layoffs and um, in some cases rehire staff. Uh, for the most part, um, I'm not seeing an awful lot of that, but I do see it in certain areas, for example, in, in, in um, some of the more uh, peripheral services that pharmacies um, have, have provided in the past, like home health care. The first one um, is the CEWS, and sorry for the acronyms. These aren't mine. <laughs> These are government bureaucrats that have, have uh, 
built these uh, these acronyms, and that's the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy uh, Program. And it, it, it supports, uh, it's available for pharmacy owners that have, have had a dramatic downturn as it relates to um, um, sales in their, in their stores. And uh, it's, um, it's a, 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 a program that um, is targeting um, owners that, uh, and, and pharmacies that have suffered a drop in gross revenues of at least 15% uh, in the month of March and 30% for the months of April and May. And it's, it's, so it's, it's been in place being in place for a 12 week period since the 15th of March and, uh, well, it's set to expire on the 6th of June. And, uh, I don't know what the plans are, um, going forward. So that's something that, um, um, most owners probably will not, um, be eligible for, but the ones that are hardest hit, like the aforementioned clinic stores and some some other um, isolated incidents, I think, or situations, um, you know, certainly want to consider that. There's uh, also a, um, a temporary 10% wage subsidy program um, that also has been uh, provided. And it is something that um, it's a three-month measure, me measure as well. And and uh, it, it basically is a cash flow um, strategy um, because there's bills to pay, and when you know revenue is re reduced, it, it, it's it's all about the timing and when the cash comes in and when your when your bills come due. And so I encourage um, um, uh, owners uh, to to visit that as well uh, because it, it it will be available to uh, reduce the amount of payroll deduction that a pharmacy owner may be required uh, to submit. Uh, to the CRA, and um, and uh, there's a broad range of ownership scenarios that uh, it accommodates, and and many of these I do see uh, with um, you know pharmacy owners themselves. Um, so that's something that I definitely um, think is worthy of consideration. Uh, credit is king, and back to cash flow. Uh, there's a program which is referred to as the Br Business Credit Availability Program, the CAP. And uh, it has been, it's being facilitated and supported uh, through the Business Development Bank, uh, Business Development Bank of Canada Corporation, and uh, a second uh, group, which is the EDC, which is, isn't necessarily uh, targeting pharmacy owners, the Export Development um, uh, Canada uh, entity. And they're working with, uh, with uh, private sector lenders, um, namely the banks, uh, to coordinate uh, you know, credit solutions for independent uh, businesses, including pharmacy owners. And there's loan guarantee opportunities there and some co-lending programs for, for small um, businesses, business enterprises that I would uh, encourage pharmacy owners to, uh, to um, have a look-see at. Uh, the Canadian Emergency Business Account, CBA, is... is um, is another um, program, if you will, that all pharmacy owners definitely want to avail themselves. Um, it is um, it's a um, it's a program that provides uh, interest free loans of up to forty thousand dollars to small businesses um, to help cover uh, operating costs um, during this period of time. Where you know you're having some challenges, increased costs, as you mentioned, Justin, as well as um, um, in some cases, you know, dramatic drops in revenue. And most pharmacy owners would qualify um, because you need to demonstrate that you've paid between twenty and twenty thousand and a million five in 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 total payroll in two thousand and nineteen. And yes, there are, there is that wide range of of uh, pharmacy independent owner uh, ownership experiences out there. Um, so that that's a little bit um, in terms of um, owners. I also don't want to forget that uh, there's some benefits associated with um, uh, taxes. Um, most importantly, um, on a personal level, we've 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 had the cutoff date for submission of income taxes pushed back by a month, and so it gives um, in addition pharmacy owners uh, who are submitting. Um, uh, income taxes um, uh, corporately, uh, more time to pay those uh, income taxes. 
And there's also been a deferral on uh, sales tax remittances um, in many cases uh, until June. And that's something that your bookkeeper probably should have you already live to. Uh, we can't forget, though, there's a large contingent of, of self-employed uh, pharmacists um, out there who you know, started their own uh, locum uh, practice, who aren't necessarily on payroll with um, their employers and they may work for a number of different pharmacies. And so I, I haven't forgotten the relief locum locums out there as well. And that's where the Canada Emergency uh, Response Benefit um, really is uh, supporting self-employed individuals. And it provides a, a taxable benefit of $2,000 uh, every month, namely every four weeks for up to 16 weeks. And I would, I, I don't want to make a prediction here, but I, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised um, if, if things continue the way they are, that that, that program or, or similar program slightly modified uh, will continue to be available. And it's facilitated through an online questionnaire that'll help direct, direct you through the various service options that best fit uh, your situation, namely eligibility for employment insurance and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that is um, a very quick overview Thank you, Mike. That was uh, extremely insightful, and I'm sure our listeners and, and all pharmacy professionals in the province and across uh, Canada will find that uh, helpful as they plan for the future and uh, look to weather this, uh, this storm for the next uh, likely several weeks and, and perhaps even months. And I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of our guests on today's show, Mike, Yvonne, and Alex. On the outset, uh, when we started the uh, podcast, um, we we started with the welcome news that the Ontario government stepped in to cover the co-payment for patients and pharmacies for the next two months in, in May and June. And uh, we believe that the government will likely transition back to 90-day supply for patients uh, in some time at the end of June, early July, depending on the data from wholesalers and manufacturers on where we are with both domestic and, and global supply chain. I think it's important to underscore that uh, in any discussion with government as an association advocating on behalf of our members, uh, there's peaks and valleys. Um, and one of the things that uh, as OPA we did is we, we continued to work really hard to get changes to what was originally proposed by government back in April. And, and certainly when the government posted their regulations um, on co-payment relief uh, May 1st, we continue to work collaboratively with government to come up with changes to the program and advocated uh, very strongly for full coverage of both uh, co-payments um, and the additional uh, dispenses that uh, was an unintended consequence uh, from the 30-day policy being implemented. And I think it's evidence that as an association, uh, being at the table is important with government being respectful, um, yet uh, also expressing disappointment when uh, things fall short. But I do want to take this opportunity to thank the, the Ontario government, the Deputy Premier, Minister of Health, Christine Elliott, for recognizing the need to provide this relief for patients uh, and for pharmacies so that they were not uh, in a position of incurring even additional uh, costs uh, on top of procuring their own protective equipment and uh, retrofitting their stores, um, as we talked about uh, earlier. So it's important to to acknowledge the efforts of um, all of the pharmacists out there who are um, truly the heroes and our front line, um, not just in pharmacy, but across all of the healthcare system. And I know the, uh, the government is uh, in uncharted territory and dealing with uh, long-term care homes and a number of other, uh, you know, hotspots in our healthcare system. But as we work together, both from an advocacy standpoint and also as um, citizens, uh, we do need to uh, come together and, uh, and we're seeing that. And, and this is a great opportunity now for, for not only OPA, but all pharmacy professionals in the province to demonstrate our value and to continue working on the important uh, advocacy priorities around scope of practice and our role in uh, providing vaccinations, uh, prescribing authority, uh, and a host of other things. Uh, I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in to our third episode of the Pharmacist Matters uh, podcast. 
we look forward to uh, talking to you next month in June for our fourth episode. And I wish everyone uh, well, stay safe. And uh, until next time, we'll chat then.